at dawn, a crow man was searching for his horses when he came up a hill to look over upon a river of men and horses. The Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors were about to charge down the hill toward the crows. The man raced to the crow camp. He warned everybody, and immediately ten best warriors were sent toward the enemy to hold off the initial charge just long enough to set up battle lines and to put up a fortress of teepee poles and covers. The Battle of Prior Creek just started. In those years, the Sioux and the Crow were enemies. The Sioux often raided Crow territory, counting coups. Intertribal warfare on the plains was a way through which young men climbed the social status as warriors, showing how brave, skilled, and tactical they were. By the mid-1800s, the westward expansion of the United States impacted the Sioux and Cheyenne in today's states of North and South Dakota. The pressure drove these people westward in the way of Crow territory, which they considered settling on. With time passing, this intrusions began to be more frequent and more violent. Before we begin, I would like to ask you to consider subscribing to the channel if you like my work, since around 95% of my viewers are not subscribed. Thank you. In 1910, an old Sioux man and his wife came to the Crow Reservation and lived there. This Sioux man was a survivor of the Battle of Prior Creek and would often tell the whole story in detail. On the other side, a Crow man named Child in the Mouth had also been an active participant in the conflict and never got tired of telling and retelling the battle story. This is great because we have both perspectives of the battle. In the early summer of 1859, a Crow war party killed a fine young Dakota Sioux warrior. He had already counted a number of battle coops, which entitled him to wear an eagle feather war bonnet. His mother was overwhelmed with grief and decided to mourn until her son's death was avenged. Almost every evening she led her son's horse through camp with the war bonnet tied to the saddle. As she passed the teepees, the woman would challenge the warriors. She would say, Is there a man among the mighty Dakotas who will take this horse and go fight the crow? She would do this for a whole year. Then one day, a man named Brave Wolf, who was very much in love with a girl and wanted to make her his woman, asked his sisters and aunts to arrange a wedding. The women were silent. An outspoken aunt finally said they did not like the girl and did not want her as a sister-in-law or daughter-in-law. Brave Wolf was deeply hurt and decided to kill himself. He decided to join a warrior society who took the suicidal oath to die fighting for their people. By doing this, Brave Wolf would die with glory. Next time the morning woman approached, Brave Wolf took the reins of the warhorse. At this moment, the woman said, At last, a brave one has taken my son's horse. Within moments, a big crowd gathered around to see what was going on. Brave Wolf was the instant hero that day. A council was called, and a chief spoke. He said, This is not just one man's decision. By his action today, we, the Dakota, are committed in what could be a very important and serious undertaking. I ask if the Great Spirit has meant it to be this way, and I say let us take one whole year to make plans against the Raven people. They are not many, but they are shrewd and tricky in battle. The time has come that we must destroy them. Later that fall, another council was called. It was decided that all the bands of the Dakota Cheyenne and Arapaho be invited to join in a great undertaking. Emissaries were sent to all other bands with instructions to stay with these bands for the winter. Their task was to influence the bands to take part in moving into territory of their traditional enemies, the Crow. The emissaries did their work well. By the next May, all the Dakota, Cheyenne, and Arapahos began coming to the designated place of gathering, which were Big Goose Creek and Little Goose Creek. 
As the bands started to arrive and set up their teepees, with time the encampment grew larger and larger. It's been said that this was the first time in Sioux history that all the bands came together to wage war against a common enemy. Scouts reported that the Crows were at Pass Creek, only a half day's ride to the north. The war chiefs quickly gathered in council. The Arapaho chief was asked to speak. He said, The Dakota people and their Cheyenne friends know me as Night Horse, Arapaho chief. Other tribes also know me. I fear no man of any enemy tribe. I am in Crow by birth, and I will not fight my own relatives. This is not native war you are planning. To destroy another tribe is wrong. I don't want any part of it. However, I give permission to my warriors to stay and fight with you if they desire. You have heard me. Night Horse broke camp and departed, heading for the Bighorn Mountains to the southwest. He quickly dispatched his two half-crow sons to warn the crow camp of the war expedition massed against them by thousands of Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapahos. In the meantime, the crows had also broken camp and began heading west. By evening when Night Horse's sons arrived, they were at Rotten Grass Creek. When they found out that a huge enemy army was only a day's ride behind them, they decided to move away as fast as possible and join with other crow bands. Teepees were taken down hastily, horses packed, and soon they were on their way. While the crows were making the fast march towards the Bighorn River, many thousands of Sioux, Cheyenne and Arapaho started their journey. Wives sang farewell songs and shrilled encouragement. Warriors whooped war cries, and old men sang praise songs. Many non-combatants joined the march, mainly wives and girlfriends of the warriors, and old and retired warriors who wanted to see the defeat of their traditional enemy. Scouts reported that the crows were at the Bighorn River a short distance below the canyon. The head chiefs decided to attack the crow camp at dawn, consisting of about 400 lodges, but at daybreak the crows were gone. Here, the chief in command estimated the size of the crow fighting force. He estimated, on the basis of three crow warriors for each lodge, that the crows were outnumbered, meaning 1,200 crows against eight to 10,000 well-prepared Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. Following the counting, the chief said, Today, when the sun sets, there will be no more crow left. We will kill all their warriors and even the old men. We will save their young boys and raise them to become Dakota warriors, and we shall marry their wives and daughters to raise more warriors to fight the whites when they follow us to our new land. The next evening, the crow reached Pryor Creek. At dawn, a crow man named Hits Himself Over the Head was searching for his horses when he came up a hill to look over upon a mass of men and horses. The warriors were about to mount and charge down the hill toward the crows. The man raced for the crow camp. He warned everybody, and immediately ten best warriors were sent toward the enemy to hold off the initial charge, just long enough to set up battle lines and to put up a fortress of teepee poles and covers. The ten crow men charged right into the Sioux, Cheyenne and Arapaho, firing into the ranks and killing a number of Sioux. As they turned around and were returning, thousands of warriors followed them down the hills in pursuit in a thundering charge. Suddenly, the valley exploded with war whoops, gunfire, and the thunder of horses. The crows had set up their first line of defense on an open flat area. Crow warriors who had guns and bows took a similar position nearby. As the Sioux and allies crossed the creek and charged, one of the crow chiefs gave a loud command and the crows opened fire with deadly results. Quickly, the warriors regrouped and made another charge, again suffering heavy casualties. The repeated charges by the Sioux and allies suddenly stopped. The crows waited, standing their ground. 
Then, a crow man decided to take advantage of the situation to try a bluff. He rode toward the Sioux, Cheyenne and Arapaho, saying in sign language, two bands of crows are on their way to join them. In truth, no help was coming. This was quickly followed by strange happenings. As the man was returning to his ranks, the Sioux scouts on the hill pointed to their warriors. Below that, a large war party was coming up the creek from the north. What happened was that a large herd of elk had become excited by the noises of battle and had started running around. Their sharp hooves stirred a big cloud of dust. Soon, the Sioux scouts spotted what they thought was another war party coming from the west. This time, the warriors could clearly see a huge cloud of dust moving fast toward the battlefield. This phenomenon was caused by a large herd of stampeding buffalo frightened by the noise of battle in the valley. The Sioux war chiefs quickly ordered an overall charge, hoping to break the crow defensive lines before help arrived. Once again, the crow lines held and inflicted heavy casualties. After that, the Sioux scouts saw a lone warrior riding hard from the hills to join the Crow defenders. His weapon was a two-pronged spear made of elk antler. Suddenly, this warrior charged right into them and began spearing Sioux warriors. Other Sioux stood their ground and opened fire with many guns. Their shots were harmless. He would circle and return, repeating the one-man charge. At this time, the crow ranks holding the defense lines broke loose into a full charge. The Sioux and their allies gave ground, breaking into a full retreat with every man for himself. The lone crow warrior was right behind them, continuing his attack. When the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho arrived at their camp, they waited two days, and when no more warriors returned, the various bands dispersed. The Battle of Prior Creek was over. Thank you for watching. If you like my channel, consider supporting it by becoming a member. It comes with many advantages.